So I want to begin this afternoon um, by just making sure, is everyone here aware of the terms extroversion and introversion? Some of those extroverted and introverted. Do I have some head nods going on? Yes? Okay, we understand these terms. Okay, well, I've got a really easy question for you then, and that is, if, if you consider yourself to be an extrovert, could you raise your hands for me? Okay. Well, now is the scary question. If you consider yourself to be an introvert, would you please raise your hand? Okay. And so that everyone feels included this morning, if you haven't raised your hand yet, can I see you raise your hand? Okay. Thank you for, for participating. Um, so extroverts and introverts, we generally uh, interact uh, with uh, other people and uh, situations like that differently. It's, it's an overgeneralization, but an extrovert wants to spend a few hours with some friends, likely come away from that situation feeling recharged and energized, whereas someone who is an introvert may spend some time in a social setting, and when they leave, they feel a little bit drained. Perhaps they need some alone time. Um, maybe even for you, if you're an introvert, after today, uh, with all this teaching and interaction, you're going to need some time to decompress. Well, wherever you fall on that spectrum of, of an introvert on one hand, an extrovert on the other hand, none of us, none of us desires to be alone all of the time. And that is because we crave human interaction. Think about the prison system. What is the worst punishment, aside from the electric chair, that you can receive in the prison system? Anyone call it out? Yeah, that's right, solitary confinement. And solitary confinement is the worst punishment you can receive because not only do we crave human interaction, we're actually designed for human interaction. And as you're hearing about today, you were made in the image of God. And to be made in the image of God means that you are a relational being. You were made for relationships. You were made for community, for fellowship with other believers. And we see this relational aspect in God Himself when you think of the Trinity. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, uh, coexisting in perfect harmony, perfect relationship eternally. I want us to think about creation as well. I'm going to read to you a quote from Dr. Michael Reeves in a wonderful book he's written called Delighting in the Trinity. He says this, thinking about creation, loving familial relationships. This God makes a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. He creates a family and makes people designed for fellowship with each other. And while our mind is back there in creation, can you think of the refrain that we hear repeated over and over again when we go through the days of creation. What is it that Genesis records for us? And God saw that it was good. That's right. Can you remember, though, one thing that God said wasn't good? Anyone? That's right. That's right. Genesis 2.18, God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And so he creates Eve from Adam's rib. But things did not remain good for very long. Once the fall happened and sin entered the world, relationships were fractured and things began to break down. Adam and Eve, they immediately noticed their nakedness and they felt ashamed. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. I'm sure you know the story of Cain and Abel, uh, where we have the first murder taking place. And now there's a lot of reasons why that, that murder occurred, but in some sense, it was a, an attack on the family. Uh, it was an attack on the unity of humanity at that time. So aside from you being made in the image of God and therefore being a relational being, what other reasons do we have for knowing that God cares about relationships? Well, firstly, God did not leave our relationship with Him fractured or broken. Um, he clothes Adam and Eve. He makes this wonderful promise that from the seed of the woman would come one who would crush the head of the serpent. Uh, we have the New Testament full of commands uh, for us to foster unity uh, and community, particularly within the local church. We're told we must love our neighbor. But think about this from the book of Proverbs. We have a list of sins that God hates. And these sins that God hates Think of the ways that these particular sins, if they're committed, actually break down human relationships. So Proverbs 6, verse 16 through 19, there are six things that the Lord hates. 
seven that are an abomination to Him, and these are the sins. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that makes haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and lastly, one who sows discord among brothers. And of course, God designed in His great wisdom that we would all meet together as His people once a year. No, twice a year, Christmas and Easter, maybe throw in Thanksgiving, something like that. No, He designed that we would meet together every single week as His people because we are designed for community, because we are relational uh, beings. This was God's plan. To be personal is important. So if you were to be human, if you are to be a fruitful and faithful Christian, it is important for us to seek the prospering and fostering of relationships with fellow human beings. So some of you here are probably uh, a little bit uh, too young to be able to remember a time when the idea of family wasn't under attack in the media and politically. And when I say family, I mean the union or marriage of one man and one woman producing children that are then cared for, educated, discipled, nurtured uh, in that home. Um, uh, growing up in Australia, it, uh, the same attacks that we're seeing today didn't exist. That makes me feel very old that in only you know, 20, 25 years from when I was in my teenage years, these truths that seem to be almost self-evident within culture and with society within society can be eroded. Uh, makes me feel very, very, very old. Uh, but this session is not about politics. I'm not here to talk about those attacks to relationships and to the family, because I believe that there is an attack against the importance of human-to-human -human interactions and relationships uh, and community that is, that is far more subtle than that, far more subtle and very dangerous. And what I'm talking about this afternoon is the threat of new technology and social media. Uh, new technology and social media. Now, the reason that it's, it's more subtle is because with every tool and platform that I'm going to discuss this afternoon, there are good things that they can be used for. And I sincerely believe that the technology that we enjoy today is a good gift from God. And much good has happened as a result of of Google and Facebook and Twitter and blogs and texting and FaceTime and all of these things. But the problem is, because of the good that we experience and because of the convenience that we enjoy, the negative consequences, some of the fallout, we get almost blind to it. We just assume that it's normal. And for you guys, it probably seems normal, and it's almost like that illustration of, of the frog in the, the boiling water, um, that the temperature is only changing one degree at a time, and so the frog never jumps out until it's too late. So how is technology threatening relationships and community? Well, for me, when I think about the olden days, I, and when technology was very different than it is today, my mind takes me back to stories I would hear from my dad or my grandfather. Uh, my dad grew up on a dairy farm, and he would tell the story of him getting up early in the morning, having to milk the cows, and then walking to school, and then spending all day in school, and then walking home, having to do homework and milk the cows again, and this just cycle repeated and repeated. And for me, I just assume that that's the olden days. But so much has changed since when I was your age, that I'm sure when you think about the olden days, or my children, who call it the olden times, um, is, is only really a couple of decades ago. So much has changed. So let me paint a picture for you. Uh, raise your hand. Can I, can I see a, uh, you? Raise your hand here if you have an internet connection at home. Okay, so I think everyone has their hand raised. Okay, now keep your hand up. Put it back up. Keep it up if you can't remember a time when you didn't have an internet connection at home. Okay, so that might be a confusing way to ask the question, but it's keep your hand up if as far as you know you've always had access to the internet in your house. Okay, more hands went up, great. Um, well, that wasn't true for me, okay? When I grew up, the internet didn't exist. I can remember being in fourth or fifth grade, and I was watching a television program called Beyond 2000, 
and it was this show that would talk about new advances in technology that we may see in the future. And of course, at the year 2000, uh, many of you, most of you weren't even born. Um, and it was on this program, during this program, that I first heard about this thing called the Internet. Uh, fast forward to seventh grade. Seventh grade was the first time I actually got to use the Internet myself. Um, I was using it on a black and white Mac in a text-only web browser. There was no Googling. Uh, we had the search engine of choice at the time was AltaVista. If anyone remembers AltaVista, um, I have fond memories of AltaVista. It's now been purchased by Yahoo. Um, but a very, very different experience. Um, and I can remember uh, waiting for lunch break and lunch period to be able to go and, and actually sneak up to these Macs that were connected to the Internet and think of things. What could I search for on the Internet? Um, I fondly remember doing some Google searches thinking if I had access to the Internet, maybe I could learn how to do magic tricks and I could become like David Copperfield or, or something like that. Um, but it was text-only browsing and very, very different to the experience we have today. Raise your hand if you have Wi-Fi at home so that iPhones and iPads and stuff can connect to the Internet. Okay, basically everybody here. Well, that's not how I connected to the Internet even when I did have it. We had to dial in. We had to make a phone call to connect to the, to the Internet. And you had to be physically connected. There was no Wi-Fi. You had to have a physical connection. And if someone in the house picked up one of the phones, then you would get disconnected from the Internet. And you'd have to wait till they got off the phone, Mom and then redial, wait for that connection to happen uh, to get back on. And in Australia, we had this thing called call waiting. Call waiting was if you were on a telephone and, a, and another call came in, you'd get a beep down the line to let you know someone else was trying to connect. Now that beep would upset the computer and the internet connection and you'd drop out again and you'd lose your connection. And at the time, homes didn't have uh, phone jacks and phone sockets in, in every room. So where our computer was, was a converted dining room, and so homes across Australia would have these long extension cords going usually from the master bedroom down the hallway, through the house, into wherever your computer was set up so you could have that physical connection. And the longer the cable, the weaker the signal, and the more likely your connection would either drop out and be slow. So a lot has changed uh, since I was your age. Um, we had the internet, but we had to be physically connected it meant that the phone line was busy, and because mom and dad didn't have cell phones, they'd always, always be saying, Nathan, get off the internet, so you couldn't just stay on for as long as you wanted. I could chat to people when I was on, on the computer. I had a PC at the time. Sanctification has taken place since then. I now own a Mac, but at the time I was using a PC. I could email people. I could chat, but I wasn't always connected, and when I was physically away from the computer, I couldn't have conversations with people but not so today. We are always on. If you are blessed, hopefully your parents have allowed you to experience some of your tween and teen years without an internet-connected device. Because as we learn from Spider-Man, with great power comes what? Great responsibility, that's right. And an internet-connected device is so powerful, uh, it's, it's a power that even many adults cannot handle the responsibility that comes with it. So your parents are doing a good thing if they are being slow and they're being deliberate and they are being thoughtful in how you use technology, how you use social media. Because unlike God, the internet doesn't forgive your sins and, um, yeah, unlike God, the internet does not forgive your sins and your mistakes. But like the accusations of the enemy, those sins will follow you throughout your life into adulthood. So how has modern technology and social media changed the way that we communicate and perhaps even begun to break down and fracture some of the relationships that we were designed for? One example for you is, is letter writing. By and large, writing letters to each other has just been done away with. It was once a staple of society. It was commonplace for people to take time to sit down, to reflect, put pen to paper, and permanently capture their thoughts and then put it in the mail and send it to you. And this required an investment of time. It was, it was a sacrifice on behalf of that person. It was almost a selfless act. And the act of them holding the pen and the paper and taking the time to do it increased the perceived value of a letter. 
as you read a letter and you hold it in your hands and you see uh, the, the pen strokes, you can tell, was this person in a hurry? Did they quickly scroll the words on the page? Or were they carefully crafting every character and every word? It's almost as if when you hold a letter, you are holding a part of another person. Unlike today's alternatives, email, texting, tweets, we fire them off, we, we send them without much thought at all. And why do we do it without much thought? Because we do not have a high perceived value of these mediums, unlike what we did with letters. It's why people still get physical invitations to weddings, because having that physical invitation to the wedding signals that this is an important event. You don't just send out a tweet and say, hey, I'm getting married on Saturday, want to join me? Hashtag married life, blessed life, whatever it is. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate. And so people send physical wedding invitations. Physical letters connect people in a way that a text or an email never can. So recently, rather unexpectedly, I was, I was sharing a meal with a dear friend, and she had recently um, gone through uh, some of her mother's belongings. And uh, her mother was a very elderly lady. And in this process, she found a collection of letters. And so she brought them out. And with my wife and my kids, we read some of these letters out loud together. Now, they were written uh, in the 1940s, just after World War II, while her parents were still dating. And they were actually separated at the time. So it was like long distance dating letters. And they, they brought us to tears. They're one of the most beautiful letters I'd ever read. The thought and the care and the romance that was contained uh, in, these, in these letters. And for our dear friend who was reading these letters from her dad to her mother, for her, she was experiencing a side of her dad that she had never, ever seen before. She had no idea that at any point in time her dad felt that in love with her mom. So it was a wonderful memory for her, a glimpse, in, a glimpse into her parents' relationships, uh, relationship that she had never seen. But after that, that meal, it got me thinking, what will my children discover when they go through my belongings? What, what letters are there for them to read? Uh, when you grow and are married and have children and you're old and gray, I, I can't imagine that your children are going to be going through chat logs on a computer somewhere or trying to look through text messages or scour through your sent folder in your Gmail account to try and figure out what did, what did my dad feel about my mom. Uh, in this, this world, this digital world that promises to capture everything, we have in fact lost something. Now, I'm not saying that written communication is the highest form of communication. That's, that's not true. John in, in Scripture in 2 John reminds us that in-person communication is better than letter writing. He says this in 2 John 1.12, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. But as a society, we have replaced letter writing. And with all the advantages of new technology, it has not been able to replicate everything. And these changes are contributing to the shallowing of our relationships. It's making it harder for each of us to fulfill our God-given design for being relational beings. So sitting down, taking the time to write a letter may be a great way for you to be more personal in a digital age. Another side effect of changes in technology is the decline of the phone call. Now, one article I read was titled, Why Millennials Are Scared to Talk on the Phone. Scared to talk on the phone. And not only are millennials and Gen Z, people like yourself, scared to talk on the phone, many of you, your idea of a phone call has actually changed. It's not just that you're nervous to have a phone conversation, it's that you actually now perceive a phone call as rude and intrusive and invasive, and to call someone is somehow to be elevating your own priorities over there and over theirs, and it's, it's almost disrespectful. Uh, I moved halfway around the world in early 2012 with my family to come and, and live and work here in Central Florida, and since that time, so for the last seven and a half years, have a very regular and constant text conversation 
with my family back home, with my parents, because moving here meant that I said goodbye to mom and dad, and that my kids said goodbye to their grandparents, and so we've been texting ever since. But despite those text conversations, still a highlight is whenever we can sit down and have a FaceTime call, because my parents back in Australia, they want to see us, they want to see our face, they want to hear our voices and the tone of our voices, they want to see their grandkids as they've been growing and things like that. So many, many blessings come with something like FaceTime. But still, despite that, sometimes when I am driving home from work, just on my commute, I'll give my mom a call. Um, No FaceTime, just an audio call, a traditional call. And I have nothing important really to share. There's no news to share. I'm just giving my mom a call. And you know what she says? It's so good to hear your voice, Nathan. It's just so good to hear your voice. That phone call, despite no important news, no significant news, the act of her just hearing the voice of her son reminded her that I loved her. It uh, fostered a a sense of love and longing in that relationship. It, It prepared a breach separated by thousands of miles around the world, something that a text message never could. And so as we allow other forms of communication to displace even the phone call, it is resulting in a shallowing of relationships. So maybe call mom and dad sometime. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Um, So making this phone call, making a phone call, could be another way for you to be more personal in a digital age. Now, I've got another illustration for you. This time, it doesn't really demonstrate how relationships are breaking down, but I think it helps to illustrate how, as technology changes, the way we perceive things that were once considered normal and okay Uh, can change, and that is the downfall and demise of the doorbell. Um, For millennials and Gen Z folk, the the doorbell is not appreciated at all. Uh, One article was titled, I'm a millennial and I refuse to use a doorbell. Now, maybe you understand exactly what's so scary about a doorbell, but if not, let me explain it to you. So, It's believed now that a doorbell is fear-inducing, it's terrifying, it's highly invasive. Why would anyone ring a doorbell when you can send a text? What kind of crazy person would ring a doorbell? Just text me to tell me, I'm here, I'm in the driveway, you know, whatever the, the point may be. And it amazes me, it fascinates me that this noise, ding dong, that used to signal, oh, someone's at the door, I wonder who it could be is now the noise that makes someone go, oh my goodness, someone's at the door. Are you expecting anyone? Looking at the phone, I was texted, I didn't organize, like, let's hide in the closet. Um, All because of the way we now communicate through texting and, and email and instant messaging and things like that has caused the demise of the doorbell. So once we wrote letters, once we called each other, Once, we used to ring the doorbell, and then when we were together, we actually looked at each other in the eyes. Instead, today, we're surrounded by screens. Don't raise your hands, because I can see there's some mom and dads here, but in your mind's eye, raise your hand. How many of you have parents that use their devices at the dinner table or the breakfast table? How many of you young people wish you could use your device at the breakfast table or dinner table. Or if you don't have a device, wish you could have a device so that you could use it at the breakfast table or dinner table. I think it's remarkable that you can visit a restaurant and see what I assume is a husband and wife sitting there sharing a meal and they're both looking down at their devices. Or you'll see a family and perhaps mom and dad are chatting, but the kids are there glued to their iPads. They're paying for this meal, like what are they thinking? but they're not using this as a time to deepen and strengthen their relationship. It's not exactly meaningful family time. And you are the next generation of leaders in this world, in the church, in families across this country, and you must fight for the importance of human-to-human relationships and fellowships. It's part of being made in the image of God. We need you to be personal in a digital age. Because imagine this world that's not too far away. We've already stopped calling a cab or calling a taxi. We say, can someone just call an Uber? But really, we're saying, can we open an app and press a button? 
Um, but in the near future, when you open an app and push a button, you won't even have a taxi driver because there'll be self-driving vehicles. So it's another human interaction that ordinarily we would encounter that will disappear. Soon you won't have a mailman because drones will come and deliver your mail for you. And as AI and artificial intelligence uh, gets better and improves, customer service will no longer be human to human, uh, but it will be human to bot. Uh, you don't call people anyway, you only chat. So if you're going to be chatting with people, let's just have a really in, in, uh, intelligent chatbot answer those questions for you. In the coming decades, I am convinced for you to be able to stand out, to be distinct, we have the opportunity to be human first, to recognize that we are creatures made in the image of God, that there is tremendous value in restoring, fostering, and promoting human-to-human -human interactions and relationships. Question for you, uh, anyone here know the mission statement of Facebook? Just raise your hand if you do know it. The last seminar, no one raised their hand. I didn't expect anyone's ever taken the time to uh, read Facebook's mission statement. I could tell you something scary and say this is their mission, but that's not true. Uh, they have a very nice sounding mission statement. Part of it is to, quote, bring the world closer together. But Facebook isn't actually doing that, and neither is YouTube and other social media platforms. They're not really bringing the world together. I read the story of uh, Sir Walter Scott recently. Some of you may know of Sir Walter Scott, and he was traveling from London to Edinburgh in a stagecoach. These were the things we had before there were cars, uh, so four wheels and a horse pulling him along from London to Edinburgh. And on this journey, he was sitting next to a man, and he tried to have a conversation with him. He broached every topic he could think of, the weather, politics, books he had read, and couldn't engage this man in a conversation. So eventually, flabbergasted, he just said, well then, what can we talk about? And you want to know this man's answer? Again, I'm sure you won't be able to guess. He said, bent leather. I don't really know what bent leather is, um, and Sir Scott probably didn't know much about bent leather either, but he said when he was recounting this that it was one of the most interesting conversations that he could ever remember having. I'm sure in today's world that Facebook's algorithm would never have shown Sir Walter Scott this gentleman's post on uh, bent leather. He would never have seen it. I'm sure this gentleman would never have had a friend recommendation from Facebook saying, perhaps you should be friends with or follow Sir Walter Scott, because we know they had nothing whatsoever in common. But this interaction between the two of them was edifying, it was helpful for them both. And they say it takes a village to raise a child, and for us to flourish, we need to be able to have bent leather conversations. And if you're into bent leather, or whatever your niche and, and small little hobby is, it's important and helpful and healthy for you to have conversations with people that know nothing about that subject. And in the past, it was very, very easy for that to happen. You were forced to have interactions with people that were not like you or didn't have your favorite preferences or hobbies. But the internet makes it possible for you to only interact with people that are exactly like you, and that is not healthy. A recent podcast put it like this. They said, imagine you lived in a town and you held a view that basically everyone in the town disagreed with. So 98, 99% of the people in this town think you were wrong. If you grew up in that town, you would go to school, you would have your job and walk around and know that everybody disagreed with you. And that actually may be a good thing. It may soften your convictions depending on what it is. There are, of course, going to be circumstances where being in the minority um, and just tightening your fist and, and gritting your teeth is important. But it's almost as if within a normal community, there's this built-in mechanism to prevent unhelpful and dangerous or radical views uh, bubbling to the surface. But thanks to the internet and social media, that's not true today. Because you go online, you can find that one or two percent 
that agree with everything you think about, the Christian faith and Star Wars and Marvel movies and singers, whatever combination of idiosyncrasies you have and preferences you have, you can find that 1% in your town and in towns across the United States and in towns around the world, and suddenly you're part of what you think is a big community of people, and you're spending your days in message boards and YouTube channels with people that only agree with you, whatever that may be. But the church is a diverse body. It's made up of people of every tribe. It's made up of people of every age group, of every ethnicity, of every economic situation, educational background. We are a mixed bag of sinners saved by grace, and I believe that's by God's design. He's done it this way to help shape us, to grow us, to sanctify us, to conform us into the image of His Son. And so our devices can easily pull us away from the community that you are providentially a part of and pull you away from the flesh and blood community that surrounds you and then isolate you, isolate you in a community of people that's just like you. You think you have found a healthy community, but you've actually isolated yourself with people that are just like you. And there are many, many dangerous consequences to this. And I don't have time to get into it. I'd love to talk to you about it at another time, but there are many cases of how this has had disastrous, even fatal consequences. But enough of just general life and how technology and social media has shifted the way we relate to each other. How have these changes in communication affected the church? Well, we know that the world hates the church. Uh, it was brought up in the panel discussion. Uh, the world hates you. If the world doesn't hate you, it at least ha hates the, the truths that you proclaim. We also know that social media has given a giant microphone to anybody that's willing to speak into it, given everyone a platform. So naturally, with the rise of social media, you have uh, the rise of people that disagree with the Christian faith and disagree with what we believe. And so we see the rise of attacks and challenges and perhaps even persecution uh, to Christians, but that should not surprise us. What should surprise us is those claiming to be members of the church, and I believe many of these people are indeed true Christians, but people that claim to be members of the church using these platforms to disturb the peace and the purity and the unity of the church. It's, it seems today that no one is spared from being called out for some supposed sin or false teaching without any context being given, uh, with any, without any judgment of charity being given. What was once sinfully gossiped about between Christian friends is now posted in Facebook groups or on Twitter or wherever the case may be. And what makes it even more complicated and, and more uh, hazardous is that if you don't acknowledge whether you agree with some charge or accusation or not, then it's assumed that you have taken sides just by your silence. I'm very confident in Matthew 18 when Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone that he didn't mean post it on the internet so the world could see it. So it grieves me that these tools, these platforms, that truly are gifts from God when they're used well, and only five or ten years ago were such an edifying means for God's people. Uh, I personally found so helpful that today it seems more and more are being used by those with inside the church to tear down and to disrupt the unity and purity and peace of the church. So that's the church kind of global. Let's bring it a little bit more local now to the local uh, setting. For some people now, uh, physically attending a local church is something of the past. Why attend a church, they say, when you can watch a sermon online? Uh, perhaps you're with an online community of people, perhaps not, and you get to do all of this without the difficulty or inconvenience of having to have a shower and get dressed and drive and take a commute. Um, you also don't have the accountability of disciplined attendance at a local church, and you don't have the discipline or discipleship that comes from just being amongst God's people. 
And just as an example, we're live streaming this, this conference this weekend. Now, this is not a church service. There's not a perfect parallel. Uh, but thousands of people will watch these messages today and in the coming weeks and years. And I trust and believe that God will bless much, if not all, of that teaching to help people to learn new things and to grow. But I'm sure you would agree with me that watching the live stream at home in your pajamas alone doesn't even begin to compare actually being here in person, sitting in on these sessions, enjoying Chick-fil-A for lunch, and interacting with your friends in the break, talking about what you learned, asking questions amongst themselves like, did he really say that? Does that I don't know if that makes sense. So I found this really, really helpful. And you actually being here is changing me. Your, the way you're responding, your facial expressions change how fast I speak, whether I'm slowing down, whether I feel like I need to restate a point, and if Bill's asleep in the front here, that's giving me helpful feedback. All of these kind of things. You are my primary audience, and you cannot get this if you were just watching on the live stream. Hello to everybody on the, the live stream. Thank you for watching. The primary audience here is, is you in person. Um, in, in person relationships is important. You cannot get out of church the same as you do if you are there in person. Watching it online, you're not going to have the same experience. Uh, you need that in person interaction. Now, there are many benefits to having all of this trusted teaching online, uh, particularly when there are snow days or hurricane days for hurricanes that come or don't turn up. Uh, whatever the case may be. People are homebound due to sickness. And so technology and, and the library of content that's online can be so helpful, particularly on a Sunday for some people. But the challenge is, the problem is, when these begin to draw you away from a local church, because a live stream cannot replace the beauty and the messiness of life lived in the context of a local church. And there are so many good and trusted pastors and teachers and ministries that are releasing podcasts and things like that. But a podcast isn't a replacement for a pastor. Podcasts should supplement, not supplant, your involvement in a local church. So with the rise of, of podcasts and other changes that are coming to how we consume media, if we remain passive, it's just going to become more and more accepted that it's fine to not turn up to a local church. It's just will become the accepted norm. So we have a serious issue here. And when I say we, I mean that. I mean you and I have a serious issue here. This is not something that can be tackled by Christian leaders alone. We need your help. This is a battle that you must embrace, a battle that you must fight. And so there's two aspects of this battle, and I want to be able to give you some tips or suggestions to help you here. First, you need a fight to be present. So my first tip when it comes to fighting to be present is this. Don't allow your friendships always to be mediated through a device. And by that I mean don't allow the substance of your friendships, your relationships, to be exchanged through text messages or email. Be intentional about the time that you spend with your friends. Have in-person conversations with them and talk about things that actually matter. And if you cannot, if you cannot find a time to sit and talk with one of your friends, then pick up the phone. That thing that so many young people are scared to use, pick up the telephone and have a phone conversation. If you don't have a phone or your parents won't let you make a call or scheduling conflicts don't make it possible, then maybe even sit down and write a letter and send it to your friend. Friendships need to be nurtured. It takes time for roots to grow and to sink deep. And if you are not personal in a digital age, then these friendships and relationships will remain shallow. Second tip for you, don't allow your local church attendance to be supplanted by podcasts or online church. And I say online church in quotation marks because online church at its best is inferior, and at its worst, it's an oxymoron. The commitment to attend a local church, to be an active member of a local church, is a commitment you need to make right now at this time in your life. You need to be committed to say, I will attend church on Sunday, because if you don't make the commitment now, 
technological temptations and challenges and changes will come your way that will make it harder for you to maintain that practice. Stresses of college life and other things that are always competing to say this is a higher priority. It's more important for you to get this essay done than you to worship uh, the Lord, the Creator of heaven and earth. So make that commitment now. And if you make that commitment, then by God's grace, when you have your own children, then perhaps you'll pass that down to them, no matter what the media and technological landscape will look like for them in 30 years' time. Third tip, don't allow devices to distract you from what matters. Don't allow devices to distract you from what matters. And what matters is the moment you are in or the person you are with. The moment you are in or the person you are with. So right now, the moment you are in is here in this breakout session. This is what's important. Don't allow checking Instagram to get into the way of you hearing, I trust, sound biblical teaching. So don't allow devices to get into the way, get in the way of what matters. And what matters is the moment you're in and the person you're with. And if, if, if you actually do make the time to sit down with your friends after church to have a conversation, and you spend the whole time looking at your devices, and you haven't accomplished anything. So be mindful when you are sharing a meal with someone, having a cup of coffee with someone, or sharing a soda with someone, whatever it is, look them in the eye. Listen to what they say. It's far more significant than giving them a heart on Instagram or whatever, take the time to look them in the eye, away from your screen, and listen to them. So I have a challenge for you, uh, some homework for you, perhaps tonight or tomorrow over lunch. I challenge you to have a conversation with your parents and ask them and discuss the idea of perhaps making your dinner table a device-free zone. Now, there is no biblical command that that needs to happen. There's no obligation on the part of your parents to do that. But I think the act of you having that conversation and saying, Mom and Dad, why, why do we let Dad check his work email at the dinner table? Um, why do we let Sally play uh, Candy Crush or Billy play Fortnite at the dinner table? Having that conversation, I think, would be fruitful. No matter where your parents land on it, actually having that conversation and thinking about why is it that we do the things we do with our devices when we do them? Extraordinarily beneficial. So for mom and dads out there, I'm sorry that that difficult conversation might be coming. So fight to be present. Secondly, fight to love. Because Christ calls us to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so who is your neighbor? It can be easy to forget the pixels of people, that those on the internet are your neighbors, and behind every pixel is a flesh and blood person who's reading your tweets, reading your texts, looking at your snaps, uh, going through and processing your emails, whatever it is, there's real flesh and blood people doing that. And in this digital realm, for the Christian, it's meant to be a realm of love and holiness in which you are obeying the commands of Christ. Yet it seems, for whatever reason, once we connect to the internet, things that in the past would have been common sense or just considered standard etiquette, it just all disappears. And so we're willing to say things online, whether in a Twitter debate, a blog post, a text thread, that we would never dare say in person if they were in front of us, because it takes far less courage. And so we get this thing that I like to call keyboard courage, and then we act in the most unloving and thoughtless ways. I'm not saying you do, I'm trusting you don't, but a lot of people do keyboard courage. So here are several tips to leave you with this afternoon to help you be more personal, more loving, more neighborly, to act in a way really that's becoming of a Christian when you're online. The first tip is this, be quick to read and slow to comment. Be quick to read and slow to comment. In the Bible, James tells us that we should be quick to hear and slow to speak. But what does that look like online? It means reading posts, it means reading articles before we actually respond, before we leave a comment, before we reply, because that's how we love our neighbor. It's how we listen online is by actually taking the time to read their words. I think it's important when someone texts you or emails you, really read what they said, because if you just give it a quick once over and send off a reply, so much miscommunication can happen. And what you're really doing is elevating your words above their words because you care about what you have to say more than them. 
So listen to them by reading what they say online. Second, give the judgment of charity. You're going to see a lot of things posted online by your friends, by your pastors, by other people that you respect. Assume the best. You see, as sinful people, we like to think, I make mistakes, but everyone else sins. I had the best of intentions, but they had the worst of intentions. No one gives a judgment of charity. You must learn to assume the best. And they've done tests with this, um, particularly with text-based communication. If you receive an email from me, if I were to send you an email, and it's a very neutral email just with some, just some information in it, no emotion, you will receive that as being a negative communication. If I try and write an email to you and I put a little bit more flowery language in there to be a little bit more friendly, the tests show that you're going to receive that as a neutral email with no emotion. And if for some reason I actually sent you an email because I was displeased with you, perhaps it was a corrective email, then you're going to think I was really, really, really upset with you. So give the judgment of charity. Assume the best. Following on from that thinking, the next tip, guard against gossip. Uh, I mentioned Proverbs 6.19 earlier, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to Him, and that last one was one who sows discord among brothers. It is godly, it is right, it's a good thing for you to guard against gossip in your normal, offline, real-world life, but you need to be aware how easy it is to fall into gossip because of how easy it is to communicate with people these days. To just send off a text to one of your friends and say, did you see what Sally posted on Instagram this morning? And just go down this dark path of slander and gossip, assuming the worst and not demonstrating love. One of the best pieces of advice that I ever received, I just throw this out as a bonus tip for you, is if someone is willing to gossip uh, to you, they're willing to gossip about you. So if you have friends that like to gossip to you, be brave enough to love them enough and to call them out of it, call them out on it, and tell them the truth, that gossip is not acceptable as a Christian. Another tip here for you, you may be noticing a trend that a lot of these are relating to just how quick it is for us to be able to send things out on social media. My next piece of advice is sleep on it. Proverbs 15, 28 says, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Social media, blogging, self-publishing with eBooks it's given rise to a world without editors and without wise counselors. Today, we do not ponder anymore, but it is godly to ponder. If you have an opinion, you just publish it. You just put it on a blog, put it on Facebook, whatever the case may be, but it is godly to ponder. Do you actually take the time to think when you share a photo on Instagram what it is you will say? how your words may be misinterpreted, perhaps what you're wearing or where the photo was taken, what that may signal to those that are seeing it. Are you pausing and taking the time to ponder? Before you comment online, do you question whether or not your words reflect the heart of someone who loves the Lord and loves their neighbor? So finally, final tip for you. Um, If you were to be personal in a digital age, you need to consider how you spend your time. There are so many temptations, so many distractions in our day and age. You need to consider how you spend your time. Paul, in Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 16 says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. We can spend an inordinate amount of time on the foolish just watching video after video after video on YouTube. And we've always done things like this, thought about and we're fascinated with the foolish and the unimportant things. The challenge is, or the issue is, we now have social media and Google search that's recording everything you do. So we're now documenting all your imaginations, all your fascinations, and how you waste your time. But our time here on earth is short, So does your social media usage demonstrate a whole life lived for Christ, one in which you are redeeming the time, living by countercultural values of godliness, family, church, and the importance of personal relationships? When you consider 
the changing climate, technological climate that we're in, and the changes that are bound to come over the next decade, and the way that they're very likely going to even further minimize the importance of human-to-human -human interactions and relationships, the very thing you were designed for, are you ready? Are you ready? Many of us are not. Many of us are still learning. Most of us are making mistakes. And as Luther said, the Christian life is meant to be a life of repentance. So if you're feeling perhaps overwhelmed this morning, maybe you're concerned that you have not been living as Christ calls you to in the way that you've been using devices and social media, then I would encourage you to repent and to look to Christ, to trust in Him, knowing that His perfect life, His death, His resurrection is sufficient to cover even your social media sins. And then pray and ask God for His help. Lean on His Holy Spirit that from today you would be more personal in our digital age. I want to close in prayer this morning, and as part of this prayer, I'm going to ask the Lord's forgiveness for the ways in which all of us have not used these good gifts of technology in a way that glorifies Him. I am as guilty, as it, I, I am as guilty of it as you. We all need to get better in how we are using God's technology. Sanctification is a process. So let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the good gifts that You have given us, namely Your Son, the Lord Jesus, for the good gifts that we enjoy in this life. We thank You for technology and the way that You have used it to advance Your kingdom um, and the way that You have used it in many respects to bring glory to You. But Father, we acknowledge that we are sinful, Lord, and we have not always treated these tools and devices and platforms in a way that brings you honor, that brings you glory. And so, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. I pray particularly for these young people, Lord, that not only would you forgive them, but that you would grant them wisdom, that you would grant them your Holy Spirit, that they would be able to live in such a way that honors you, that they, as future leaders in this world and in your church, would be far more personal in this digital age, that they would acknowledge that they have been made in Your image as relational beings, and that the changes and the challenges to the way that we communicate and consume media and the technology we use, that it would not be destructive in this world, that it could continue to be used to build up Your people and to advance Your kingdom. And Lord, we pray all this in the name of Your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen.